It's a great pleasure to welcome Lloyd Cole to Noise11.com. Uh, what a history, Lloyd. We're talking about the 12th solo album uh, here with On Pain. But, you know, if we want to start adding them all up with the commotions and the uh, best ofs and the live albums, I think we're well past the 20 mark, aren't we? I stop counting. I, I make electronic solo records as well without singing. So there's there's all sorts of stuff out there. Uh, but it's, you know, it's always exciting to be releasing a new sort of what we'd call like a proper album, not a, not a compilation, not a live album. This is a this is me trying to get on the radio again. Well, you know, I mean, you are keeping the concept of the album alive and a lot of people are starting to think in terms of singles and single songs. Uh, but, you know, actually putting an album together for me uh, is basically a timestamp of where the artist is in their career. I mean, if we, we get the single, you know, that's all w well and truly good, but it's like a, a snapshot of the day. This is really a snapshot of where you've been over the past year or so. I suppose so, yeah. Uh, and, and I've always enjoyed the process of trying to make something that, that works as an album, not just a bunch of songs thrown together. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a sort of lineage, just like it is in songwriting. You know, it's like very happy to be doing the sort of the same job that somebody like Ray Davis did. But it's also nice to be knowing that somebody like Springsteen, uh, I think he had that song Point Blank, which he recorded in, gosh, 1975, but never never found a record that it fit on until, until about 1985. And he just kept it until, like, okay, finally we've got an album that this song fits on. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's how much it was important to him to get the albums right. Even if he had this song, which had been very popular in his live set for, for almost a decade, it still didn't go on an album until it fit. Is there anything on On Pain like that that dates back, you know, maybe even decades in the past? Or is this a, the, like a brand there, new song? There, there, isn't, there isn't anything which was completely written back then, but, uh, but the song I Can Hear Everything was the music to that was written in 1983, wow. uh, and that by Blair and 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 just before we were the commotions, um, and he, it was called the Optimist, and I always loved it, but I never thought there was any way I could sing over it because it had this strange time signature. But the the advantages that we have now with modern studio systems, I was able to sort of break the song down into pieces, and make a map of it. For me to sing along, I could, I still, I'm, I could never play that song live because I still can't. When I'm listening to it, I still don't know when the one beat's coming. <laughs> it's Blair's, it's Blair's timing, and it works beautifully. But to be able to do something like that, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. Uh, and to be able to take the vocal like on that track and treat it with these synthesizers and make it into sort of part of the orchestra, also very exciting. You've uh, chosen an interesting way of introducing the record, firstly with the song Wolves. Let's talk about that one, where you've given us two different mixes of that. So here you are, you've got a new album on the way, and, you know, instead of saying, you know, th this is indicative of what to expect on the album, you've given us two uh, uh, alternate versions of what we're expecting. Um, what was the logic behind that? The logic was pretty simple. I was very frustrated by the very long lead time that we're given because of the vinyl shortage in the world right now. The album was was delivered to the record company in October, but it couldn't come out till June. Uh, and the record company would want to release the first single proper for the album about now, in, in well, a little bit earlier in, in late May. Um, and I just didn't want to wait that long. I, was, <laughs> I just didn't want to wait. Uh, so I just thought I've never done this before. Let's do. Let's get some different people together to do some mixes. And there's two before the album now, and two after the album. And the reasoning behind that is twofold. One was that Barry from Mogwai couldn't get his one finished in time. Um, and the other reasoning is that the, the the remix that Chris Hughes made is insane, and I can't let people hear it before they hear the the original version of of, of Wolves because it's so different. He's done things that I thought were completely impossible to do. I think it's brilliant, but you need to hear the album version first. So we're going to bookend the album with two premixes and two remixes. Yeah. The other uh, is Warm by the Fire. And, you know, that's you know, really an interesting lyric 
and an interesting video that goes with that, where, you know, here we are at uh, what could be the end of the world and, uh, you know, like almost this attitude, but it's warm by the fire. Uh, it's an interesting contrast that you've managed to paint in, in the lyrics of that song. And, and with the music as well, Chris was very insistent that when I sing Warm by the Fire, we make the timbre of the whole track sound warm and gentle compared to the fairly fairly aggressive feel for the rest of the track. Um, I, I, I got the idea for the, the title Warm by the Fire when I was watching the television footage of the rioting in Paris a few years ago. Uh, and the fact that it references Los Angeles in the song now is just, to be honest, a fluke. It's just something I was throwing away in a, a scat vocal to try and come up with a melody line. And Chris said, oh, I love the way L.A. sounds. It's like, OK, we can keep that, I guess. <laughs> uh, the thing that excites me more about the song than, than the potentially apocalyptic imagery, though, is what happens when the song gets to the third stage of the song and the text questions whether it's actually happening or not. Is this just, is this a film script that he's reading? Is this a video game he's playing? Is this just a role he's playing? It's not really happening at all. Or, or the thing that occurred to me doing an interview earlier today is, or is, is, is it just a song? With the lyrics itself, and I guess right across uh, the context of the entire album, uh, we have an album here that is post-COVID, the previous album uh, was just before COVID. How much of COVID and the lockdowns has affected you in your songwriting with this record? I, I don't know if I can answer it. I think, you know, when, when people say, well, how did moving to America affect your songwriting? I don't know that either. I just It's very hard to, to analyse how I'm changing because I can't step back and look at myself and uh, I can maybe look at my work, but usually the work needs a few years distance to be able to look back and really see it for, for what it is finished. I mean, for me, it's almost like it's still in in the, in, in work in progress because it's so so new. Um, so it's, it's very hard to say. It, it's, it's obviously must have had some impact. Um, but I think the 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 greater impact on the overall album, is probably just the point of getting to a certain age and realizing how awful a job our generation have done of looking after this world that we're going to be passing on to our kids. The album uh, features uh, Blair Cohen and Neil Clark, uh, two of your old commotions mates. Uh, three fifths of the commotions here in the one record, haven't we? And you've got 100% of the original core of the band as well. I mean, the, the original core of the band was Blair, Neil and myself, yeah. That's obviously a very good relationship, a working relationship that you've continued over these years? Yeah, I think it, you could you could almost argue that the relationship's been better because we did split up when we did. Being in a band's not easy. Yeah, it just, it's stressful. It, it, it encourages conflict. Uh, and so to not be in the band together, for, for us, for it not to be the thing that is our livelihood, the thing that our livelihood depends upon, maybe makes it easier for us to work together because we're still working together for the same reasons we were in, in the early days and that we, we like the way we interact musically. Uh, Lawrence, uh, who is no longer uh, working with you, and I don't think he's really involved as a... Uh as a musician anymore, but he went on to become a golf journalist. Um, and, you know, golf seems to be part of your background, doesn't it? Uh, you know, the entire uh, first album with Rattlesnakes all happened in a golf club. Uh, that That's a little bit of folklore. We, 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 we started rehearsing in the golf club, but by the time we were the commotions, we were rehearsing in the Hellfire Club in, 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 in Glasgow. But, yeah, we did, we did start uh, rehearsing in the basement of the golf club, and that's the... I ended up in a golf club in Glasgow because that's what my parents did. They worked, as, they looked after the catering and the clubhouse of uh, in, in golf. That's uh, that's how we ended up in Glasgow. Uh, interesting that he goes on to become a golf journalist, though, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely, and a really good one. Uh, I mean, uh, that book he wrote about being a caddy is is, is magnificent, uh, and he's still he's still, he's now one of the. One of the editors of a of a golf journal called Mukello, which is which is excellent. So I'm still in touch with Lawrence, and uh, 
we had we had talked about doing twenty a fortieth anniversary commotions uh, reunion, but I had to choose between doing that or doing something new. The market wouldn't really take both, and I decided to do something new. Well, that's right. We do have the fortieth anniversary of rattlesnakes coming up uh, in twenty twenty four. Uh, so if you're not going to mark it with a reunion, how will you mark that or will you mark it at all? I'm not sure it's going to, they're going to make an awfully big deal about it because they made a big deal for the 20th anniversary. And then since then, in the last 10 years, there have been two box sets, one of which was a box set of the commotions, one was a box set of my New York recordings. And then just this year, Universal have reissued the vinyl versions of the, all three commotions albums. So they're sort of being repushed now. Uh, so I don't think they can really do it again next year. They'll probably be, you know, we'll we'll have a party of so, some kind of other, and that, you know, the band even if it's just as on the internet, we'll have a we'll have a glass of something bubbly. <laughs> Invite them up to your home studio as we yeah, see at the yes. next. <laughs> that would be nice. With the commotions, you still do a lot of those songs. I think one of the most recent set lists I saw from uh, last year, uh, I think there might have been eleven or twelve songs still in the set list. Yeah, the, the set list is usually about 30, 28, 30 songs for two sets. And yeah, they'll, they'll be, let's see. I mean, I'm, already, I'm I'm going to be playing bass on the next tour in the UK. And so I've been having to learn how to play. And, you know, I found a song from Easy Pieces that we've not played since 1986 that I thought I hated all these years. And I went back and listened to it and went, ah, I quite like that now. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, there's going to be, there's going to be commotion songs, uh, but there's going to be some reimagining of them for the uh, the band tour for sure. Because we're going to be a four piece band. We're not going to sound like the commotions. We're not going to try to sound like the commotions. Uh, so it'll be it'll be fun. I'm hoping people aren't going to be desperately wanting their old songs to sound exactly like the old records because we're 62 years old. And you know the format of the band is going to be different. It's, it's going to be different, but it's uh, it's it's more exciting to me. That's you know I just had the thought then when you said uh, you're 62 years old. That means you were 23 years old when uh, Perfect Skin came out. I was yeah 22 when I wrote it. Uh, uh, all of the songs were written from the age 22 and 23, and uh, and yeah, and the album came out in October. Yeah, twenty three was. I was lucky, you know. It's not. It's it's not old, but it's not that young, you know. If people had heard the songs I was writing when I was nineteen, I I would have had no chance of ever having any success. Well, I would have been twenty five, twenty six, playing that on two WL in Wollongong, New South Wales, on the radio <laughs> back then. I remember the impact of that song. It was such a a different song on the radio. Uh, I think nineteen eighty four. We would have been around the time of what. Uh, Culture Club, Duran Duran, Spandau Ballet were all the bands that we were playing on the radio back then. And uh, maybe Springsteen, Born in the USA, Dire Straits might have been a little bit later. But uh, bang, along comes this thing. Perfect skin, Lloyd Cole and the commotions. And wow, what an impact it had on the radio. It stood out. I think we knew that we were doing something that was that was at odds with most of the things that were on the radio. But we weren't entirely alone. I mean, Orange Juice were making good music. The Smiths were making great music at the time. Aztec Camera Mate were. Uh, so it, we weren't completely out on a limb. There was just, there was there was a sort of mini movement. And I think people thought that we were sort of against synth pop, but we weren't. I loved, I mean, especially loved ABC, especially loved Soft Cell. We just, we were excited by being a guitar band at the time. Uh, I, I want to go back to the uh, the previous album, the song on there, The Afterlife, uh, where you're talking about the afterlife in a safari suit. Um, is, there, is there an actual person that you're talking about for that song? No, don't, there, there very, very rarely is. And if there is, I would never tell you. Hmm. Uh, uh, no, I'm just thinking about... Um, I'm, I was thinking it would be nice to refer to the period when... Because, you know, I, I, I like to... I like to think about the, the process of how life is different now that I'm older to how life was before. And, and retired people go on river cruises and they become invisible. They become sort of invisible to the world and, 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 and it's retirement life feels like it is almost like you're almost, it's almost like an afterlife. It's, you become, 
you, you have no impact on the world. You just float around on these cruisers in your safari suit. It's interesting, isn't it, with the uh, with the lyrics, you know, that that we hear in the afterlife and the the apocalyptic uh, messages from this one. You're obviously somebody who does think uh, very deeply and looks back at uh, at other times and compares the two times. I don't think about myself in that way, other than when I'm doing interviews with people like yourself who, who suggest that this might be the case. I'm really just interested in 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 writing. Mu- making music, writing songs, making albums. And, and if my approach to lyrics is a little different, that's just because of who I am. It's, I don't think it's better or worse than, you know, for, I, I think I like to think about great examples of amazing lyricists like Leonard Cohen, incredibly meticulous. Dylan, really quite lazy at times. Shane McGowan, again, really quite lazy at times, but brilliant at other times. Tim Hardin, Amazing, but completely out to lunch half the time. So there's so many different types of writers. Um, I, I've just, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I've got my voice now, and I have, I have a level of, I think, I have a level of being a pretty good self editor. I think, and so I, I, I don't let the song, I don't let you hear the songs until I know that they've got to a stage where. I'm happy to the point where I think, well, Leonard would probably be happy now. What about David Bowie? Uh, your David Bowie cover of choice, I see, was uh, Can You Hear Me? Uh, that's an interesting uh, choice of a Bowie song to pick. That's uh, deep down in the Bowie catalogue. You you haven't sort of jumped into the surface there. That came out of um, something we were doing during COVID. I have this Patreon page and I started doing uh, concerts in my basement and recording them onto my iPhone and putting them out on, uh, putting videos out for my followers. Uh, and I was just thinking of songs to play. And I was just, I've always loved that song. And so I just sat down one day and thought, I wonder what, what the chords to that song is. I wonder if I could play it. And I found that they were actually quite not so different to the type of chords I use. And uh, yeah, I think it's quite a moving song. It's not one of Bowie's uh, better known songs. No. No, it's not, but it's 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 one of my favorites, and that that's always going to be the choice for doing a cover song. Sometimes mm. you you don't like uh, quite often with cover songs, you really don't want to do the iconic songs. You shouldn't go anywhere near them. I remember seeing uh, Michael Penn in New York about twenty years ago, and he did Strawberry Fields Forever, and I, I it started, and my friends and I just looked at each other and went, "No." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a very wise choice with your Bowie track anyway. Uh, <laughs> Lloyd, it's uh, great to talk to you. Uh, hopefully we will hear of another tour for Australia in the not-too-distant future. It'll be good to get you back down here again. You've been a regular visitor. so uh, uh, We're working on it. Uh, we're working on it right now, so fingers crossed. Yeah, early 2024, no doubt. Actually, probably late this year. Oh, well. Yeah, I might have I might have a Christmas in Melbourne again. What What do you mean uh, Christmas in Melbourne again? You've You've done Christmas in Melbourne before. Last Last time I was over there, I finished the tour and then spent Christmas with my friend Helen Razor. Oh, fair enough. Excellent yeah. stuff. Well, yeah. I, I I hope you get to enjoy uh, a Christmas in Melbourne this year. Then, fingers crossed. All right, thank you, Lloyd. Right. You're welcome. Thanks for ha- Thanks for having Bye. me. <laughs>